Patricia Windrow at the Cable Easel, this time with part two of a program of sky painting. I mean, uh, not sky painting, cloud painting in the sky. And this particular place is Heckscher State Park. The first program took a half an hour, and this is going to take hopefully another half hour and resolve it once and for all. Here is the background uh, against which the rest of the painting is, is going to be applied. Uh, the whole, the whole, be the whole first part of this uh, of this um, study of sky was done by doing the furthest thing away from you first, and then applying the things as they come forward, and the things that are uh, overlaid on the on the sky are obviously the clouds. So. If you caught that, uh, if you caught that program, all to the good. If you didn't, maybe you taped it. And maybe you'll be able to uh, recapture some of the information that I gave you then. But in the meantime, we're going to proceed on with the um, incidental building uh, against this sky painting. As you can see, this, the the canvas is uh, almost seven eighths sky, but things happen in front of it. And namely, one of the things that happens in front of it is this building. The building, of course, is uh, an administration building of the um, of the Heckscher State Park, in which uh, probably, as I mentioned the last time, all sorts of things happen uh, in uh, that run these places. And the roof is a very large one, in my opinion. This is a this is a, this is the color. And this is the side that I'm going to put this color. It's a combination of of um, of uh, ultramarine blue, uh, basis of white, and it is uh, got a touch of purple in it because most things under the blue sky, if they are of, of large expanse, uh, tend to have a tinge of purple to them. Something that um, I have observed over the years, uh, and uh, it seems to work every time. So ob observation. That's what the whole business of working from life is about: to observe, and to compare, and then to remember. And that is a term which I suppose, that is a philosophy which I suppose was um, put forth by Mr. Ara, uh, Plato a very long time ago. Uh, and it works very nicely. Observe, remember, and compare. Here is the shadow side of the building, uh, the, the, the uh, diagonals and the um, triangles are what make this particular motif uh, interesting. It gives you some idea of the size. As soon as we put the tree in, you'll be able to understand a little bit more clearly what the size is. I'm going to pick up some of this oil, if I can ever get it open, to make the paint flow a little bit more easily. This is called uh, fat medium. Uh, it means that it's got some oil in it. But uh, the, the, the need sometimes to thin out uh, paint is evident, uh, if I don't use the marge medium, which I have stopped using pretty much altogether because it is a base of lead and it is not good for you and I've been using it for long enough and I think maybe the time has come to stop using it entirely. So I'm using this fat medium put out by uh, the people, it's called archival. If anybody wants to know about it, it is put out by chroma acrylics, and it's um, it is odorless, and it also does not have any lead in it, which is what um, which is what one should be concerned with if you've been painting as long as I have, and you find that you've been painting things with lead. Maybe the message is to uh, that's enough. So um, uh, no more of the Marge medium, even though it worked very nicely for me. It's that's it. Here is the other shadow side of this little building way off on the end, probably another little administration building with a nice little triangle, love triangles. Tri triangles are very interesting shapes and they should be paid attention to and used whenever they are there. So if, if you're looking for something to paint and you see little triangles, by all means, 
that should dictate that this is the place where you should probably stop. Uh, here is a way, this, this is the side of this building. It's all in the shadow side, and this is also, uh, as long as I have the color mixed, ready to uh, ready to apply over here. The right side of the canvas is not going to be as interesting as the left side uh, because. So much more is happening over on the left side. The sun and everything is hitting these buildings. But nevertheless, it is a uh, just an adjunct to the uh, sky, which is what you just don't do just a sky painting. You have to incorporate other things, or you should incorporate other things. There are no set rules for anything. But um, for the for, for compositionally, it is important to think about these things. These buildings are brick buildings, and the 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 color of brick in shadow is extremely dark. I'm using uh, some alizarin crimson, a touch of Van Dyke brown, and I'm making it extremely dark because uh, the uh, the monitor will tell you that uh, when this when this is in shadow, it, uh, everything becomes almost silhouetted. Um, but I do, ha I do have to indicate that, the, that this is a brick building, therefore you, uh, you do the shadow side as well. Uh, obviously, anything in the shadow side is darker. So, uh, uh, the color scheme is becoming interesting at this point. It is a, uh, a sort of a warm gray, and then the uh, red of the brick. And um, I'm going to uh, wipe that off and uh, t talk to you once again about how uh, bristles of brushes uh, re retain color and have to be very carefully uh, rinsed out in, in, in order the next time you pick up this brush that it isn't full of that bright red which will, which will turn everything pink. I'll do the tower uh, probably at the last. Uh, let me pick up a little bit more of the, um, of the uh, uh, pale gray here for the um, for the uh, little triangles of the buildings and then we'll be on to uh, doing the tree because this is only a half an hour and uh, I got to be able to get as much in as possible. The light side of this little of this little uh, building is the light side of the roof where the sun is 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 being struck by the sun and then the um, so you'll see th this denotes to you in a very simple form just with two little triangles and uh, and uh, two uh, pale gray places. There are two buildings beyond here that are um, that are behind the tree. You barely see them when the tree is there. I'll probably paint right over them, but they must be there for reference. And then the tr the roof on this one is, of course, the same the same idea. The pay the light side is over here. All right. Um, the next, uh, the next thing is this great wall, and the great wall is almost. Oh no no no! Let me get the um, let me get the the uh, brick side of the. Um, of the of the wall, and it's got some orange in it because the uh, the sun is uh, hitting it, and it's quite light. So orange, a touch of the of the alizarin crimson, and uh, there would be the light side, the the sunstruck side of this brick building, and it's done in a very simple way. Just just fill in the colors, and there is the color that um, I think probably ought to do for the uh, for the side of that uh, for the sunny side of the building. Up here we have a tower, and the tower, as I said in the first program, is a sort of a whimsical thing. I don't know what, what if it has much use except for for decorative purposes, but it is in fact um, a little uh, a little cupola stuck on top of this rather contemporary building, which I am guessing was probably built in the 19. 40s or 50s, uh, when Mr. Robert Moses was so busy on Long Island building and, and making sure that Long Island were given all these wonderful uh, gifts. And um, this this little tower, uh, it does not seem to have a clock, but it does have some louvers there, which means that it may in fact house uh, uh, some bells. Uh, I don't know. If anybody who watches this program has any information about what's in this building, by all means, a call or write to me and I'll be happy to, I'll have be happy to know it. The um, the light uh, sunstruck side of this little tower is of course uh, pale, just like the uh, wall down below was, um, and it uh, and it and it should be interpreted very. Uh, as you can see, the uh, cl it's painted right over that cloud. The cloud's a little bit thick, and um, the the uh, the presence of the two shades makes it uh, obvious that it's a um, that it is a four-sided tower. I believe four. Oh, is it six? Yes, it's six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six-sided tower. Not that you have to count numbers when you're painting, because painting is supposed to be a um, 
It's supposed to be a, an impression, but uh, by golly, if there are six sides to a tower, you better make it six because somebody is going to call you on it. It's a, it's a little bell-shaped tower, and it uh, and, and painting. Uh, you have to sort of uh, sort of have a steady hand to do this, and I I realize that um, some people say you make it look too easy, and I'd never be able to do that. But I have been painting probably longer than anybody has been alive was watching this. Therefore, I can in fact show off a little bit and show how steady my hand is and how I can do this freehand. It can come to anybody with enough practice, and um, so it should. There is a little sort of a knob on top. I wish there was something more fancy and elaborate up there, but there isn't. It's just a little knob. And then there are those dark places denoting the, the, uh, the, uh, the open places. And uh, whatever grill work is there can be put in later. But for the most part, that's about all you'd need to do, except there's a little bit of sky showing through that, and that would be rather fun. So just a touch of pale blue will show the sky showing through that little um, grill work which I think is always rather fun to do. Pick it up a little little tiny bit and it makes it rather mysterious. A little bit, a little, one more dot. There we are. Seeing through that tower. Good. Now, the wall, which is, uh, which is needs to be put in now because it's the next thing that's farthest away, is a very uh, shadowy and there's almost no way of being able to see the details of it. So I'm just going to merely put it in in its silhouetted form. It is very dramatic this way. It has the angle that, that I'm always looking for. It's got a few details in it, which I'll pick up later, but it is in fact one great dark swath across this entire uh, lower part of this composition. Uh, a brick wall with very little interruption, probably gates that you can go through, but um, it is preparing the uh, preparing the canvas to receive the trees that are in front of it. Uh, it the monitor and the uh, the tape that was made is is extremely dark because of the time of day, and the sun is not striking any of this. The sun is on the other side, therefore missing a little bit. However, uh, the drama of uh, of a composition like this with these uh, with this color scheme, which in my opinion is somewhat foolproof, if you have pale blue and deep red and a touch of pale red and some white, uh, you could build a living room color scheme around this particular set of colors, in my, in my opinion. Uh, the green will be added later, but right now it's to, it's, it's, it, it is already a very acceptable uh, color scheme. Uh, in this wall, there it is, East Islip, New York, that's where it is. I'm glad to see that um, some information is being put forth for the people who are going to be interested in seeing this. Somewhere in here, there are divisions uh, in the wall that are that are sh sort of show in a very pale manner. I'm not quite sure what they are because it is in such deep shadow. But just a suggestion is uh, is almost enough to make them, to, to keep the mystery. Um, and in front of it there are some trees, uh, the trunks of the trees in front of it, which will, um, which will tell you that uh, the, the wall is, uh, is separating the trees from the buildings. Here are some dark places in this, uh, in this wall, very simply interpreted and very uh, and uh, almost no detail, just has to be there to be able to tell the viewer that something is happening to that wall. If there was, um, oh, there's more here. There's another dark place here, as I can see. Uh, sort of, so, so it's a wall that is being supported by, uh, by some buttresses on the other side. It's a very long wall, so it has to have some support someplace. Well, um, way off in the distance, and before I take this break, let me just pencil in or paint in ever so slightly the water that I talked about uh, probably in the p part one of the um, of the Great South Bay which is visible from certain parts of this park and that can be put in in a in a, in a sort of almost cobalt blue even though the atmosphere is a little bit hazy and the clouds are a little bit wispy you will um, you will uh, agree uh, that even though the water is barely visible on the um, on the uh, monitor, it is nevertheless there, and it also tells you something else. It tells you that this is Long Island. Long Island has its um, has its characteristics, just like all faces have their own characteristics. Long Island's face uh, has the characteristic of water being able to be seen from just about everywhere, except of course the middle of the island. Uh, and then if you climb up high enough on Bald Hill, you will see water on both sides. So the identifying thing about Long Island and its scenery is its water scapes just about everywhere. Um, this is going to be take a short break so that I can uh, come back and resolve this painting once and for all with the tree. So the second part 
of the second part, which is what's going to be coming up, will be the finalizing of the painting and the composition with the, the foreground and this wonderful willow tree, which is no longer green because the time of year has changed and has turned its sort of cinnamony, uh, reddish color, very mysterious. So I'll be back in very shortly. the painting of the willow. Uh, that's to be done with an entirely different brush. And let me sort of uh, free, uh, you know, freehand show you how I'm going to stick this in here. Uh, everything has a light side and a dark side. And even something as um, well as free form as a tree trunk, especially an old tree like this willow, you have to sort of lay it out. And this tree trunk uh, di bisects the end of this, what I have just been told is probably an old, an old bathhouse. This great big thing with the, with the roof is, was an old bathhouse. Uh, no longer used as one, but more than likely um, uh, used for other, oops, other purposes. I'm laying this out with some very liquid paint, which sort of s s dripped down there. And here's the general uh, formation. The tree slants a little bit, which is what, uh, what um, makes it interesting. It's an old one, and it probably has slanted to the will of the wind all over all the years. And then this nice uh, branch that comes out uh, from the side here and sort of curves up and forms a Y and it's higher than the tower. Points of reference, which I talk about uh, many, many times. So uh, whenever I have the opportunity to t talk to you about points of reference, I'm going to do it. So here's this Y uh, coming down and it meets approximately there. This particular part of the tree is about the same height as the, as the tower. And then there's another Y that sort of snakes up here and goes off in this direction. And then it turns up into the, it turns off into the, the foliage part and the very leafy part. Now willows sort of lose their leaves in the wintertime, but not completely. And if they do, uh, there are so many branches that you still get uh, the general form of a, of a tree from just the myriad numbers of branches that do, in fact, of course, remain during the winter time. The, um, the, um, m most willows, in my opinion, turn sort of yellow because of all those amazing branches that are one, you know, so many hundreds and hundreds of little hanging branches do turn uh, willows sometimes quite uh, yellow. Uh, this one has gotten a touch of something else. Let me put the, the light side of this willow tree in here that is just happens to be catching a little bit of light from, uh, from some source on the other side of the wall, maybe just the sky. But it is important to give that tree its little bit of light because it is in such darkness against the, um, against the dark wall. Uh, a, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of, um, of, uh, of a light co quality uh, is, assures the believability of the fact that this is a, a round trunk of a tree. I think you'll agree that that uh, is vital. Now, I'm going to be using one of my newly acquired brushes. I just happened to buy this one today. 
Ah, the price is still on it. You have to bite the bullet when you buy these things. It was $7.15. It turned out to be $6.83. But it's a sable brush. It's made in England. It is vital to be you to use for this kind of a thing. You've got to have a flexible, um, very cooperative uh, brush when you're doing this kind of uh, thing. So, uh, I'm just giving you uh, what it is that you have to do in order to be, um, to be part of this painter's uh, gang, to be willing to spend the money and, um, and take care of them. That's the main thing. So spending the seven bucks or the six bucks is one thing. Taking care of them is quite another. Okay, um, the general form of these tree, of these, of these branches that are hanging down, is, um, is it, it, it hangs over here. It's a little bit darker than that, and I'm going to have to darken those values. Values. And uh, this is a deliberate painting technique. You must, in fact, because your background is ready to receive these, it must be obvious to anybody who sees this painting that this is, in fact, a willow. And the only way you can do that is certainly not like some of the some of programs that I have seen, whereby you kind of hit the canvas with a brush full of color and say, "Well, that sort of looks like a tree, doesn't it?" Um, it is a deliberate. Uh, gesture and it has got to be done with observation and also preparation. So up here, uh, with it, and it should be interpreted, of course. It can't. But I'm not going to start uh, painting 18 million uh, hanging branches, but it has to have a certain uh, deliberate quality to it as well as interpretive, which may be a contradiction in terms. But I think you, as long, if you see what I'm doing here, you'll understand that the parts that are solid uh, are solid. And and that's where the branches are so close together that they they appear to have a solid form. And then as they as they s sort of work their way down to the tree, they are in fact um, become wispy and hair-like and willow-like. Uh, and the uh, the wonderful dramatic quality of this kind of thing. Uh, is manifested now. This is a sky painting, but the tree has to be accurate and it has to be interesting, and it uh, and it ought to be done with a certain amount of flair and some understanding of what the tree is all about. Um, yeah, Any time that there's a willow, in my opinion, you've got yourself a um, an Oriental landscape. This is not Oriental because of the presence of that building, which is strictly American, strictly. I mean, absolutely, no question about it. That's an American building right there. But the tree gives you the flavor of all those amazing Japanese prints with these weeping willow trees. Um, and the fact that this one is in silhouette against the sky makes it really interesting to me. You will find that I'm using, uh, you'll, well, I'm telling you, I'm using a very, very uh, liquefied color and um, doing the deliberate strokes of these hanging branches. They come almost down and, and touch this building and um, are, uh, and the fact that the building was painted first enables you to do that. If you hadn't, if, if I hadn't painted the building first, you would have trouble getting the believability that these, um, that these great branches are hanging down over the building. So it's all preparation. It's what I, what I keep uh, expounding every time. You prepare, um, you prepare it in stages. Uh, I'm using a combination of alizarin crimson, some Van Dyke brown, a touch of um, black and a touch of orange. And wherever the building, wherever the building, wherever the tree happens to be quite dark, I simply uh, blend them all together. Uh, hopefully this is going to be uh, a believable s uh, item here. And I, I want to continue uh, to, to do this uh, at the risk of boring everybody to death, but that's what painting is. It's not boredom, it's diligence. And you set your mind to it, and if it takes this long to do it, well, by gosh, that's what it takes. And, uh, and a lot of people say, I could never paint, I don't have the patience. That may, there may be some truth to that. But I think that when you are involved in trying to get something stated, uh, you will, you'll find yourself interested enough to make it work. The challenge is, can I pull this off? So here, once again, is, uh, is the uh, point of reference that these little, the, these little wispy branches that are uh, now totally leafless are not quite as high on this particular branch as the little tower, and then they become a little bit higher, and then they become a little bit wispier up here. So 
the logic is what I'm also after. And then here's a wonderful sort of nice uh, hanging over thing over the, over the cloud. And you have to be willing to paint over your wonderful cloud. You may think that you've painted the world's greatest cloud in the world, but you have to be willing to paint over it. And here is the general technique. Before the time wears out too fast, I'm now continue to paint this as the as the time goes by. Uh, but I want to I want to just quickly uh, emerge myself uh, into the foreground because there is there is a need to get that in to have this thing as complete as possible before the time runs out. This is going to be a combination of the uh, quick drying white, some of my. Um, uh, thalo uh, yellow green and some of the sap green probably to see whether or not I can just have the final color scheme of this uh, of this painting uh, uh, resolved once and for all we can go back to the tree but I do want to get uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the green in I'm going to use some of my that is going to um, make it a little bit uh, more spreadable and uh, that was that's the point of the uh, of the oil the um, the need to uh, to try to resolve these paintings is is uh, it twofold that you can in fact demonstrate how to do a painting in the space of an hour, which is what this is going to have been, but it, also to try and get the general overall effect of it uh, during that period of time. Um, the fact that the uh, lawn here is behind this brick wall means that the green is tempered somewhat. It is uh, it's not if it were brilliantly lit by the sun, it would be uh, well extremely pale. As it is, it, uh, it must by force remain quite dark. Uh, and I hope that that's dark enough. Uh, the um, the uh, tricks that the um, television plays sometimes makes me wonder whether or not any of these colors are really true. But um, uh, I, I spoke about the wonderful color scheme of this and that's what this is. That's why I'm putting this foreground in here of this dark and um, nice, very narrow band. I'm putting it in just quickly, demonstration. I will, um, I, I may put some details in it later, but the, for demonstrational purposes, this is all I need to do. In the, in the, um, the time is running out. I just got that, uh, that signal that um, we only have a few more minutes to go. The little, the little silhouetted tree way off here that looks uh, almost like a like a stray on the uh, on the african uh, on the african landscape is a little tree with a little silhouetted um a trunk and a sort of a well it looks like a little a little sort of an umbrella like tree but it is but it's it's important it's there it is a nice detail off there in the uh, off there in the distance it has a little one that sticks out here and sort of there and it uh, it needs to be in there and then there's another one that sort of does not have too much personality except that it's in silhouette and anything in silhouette assumes a personality uh, which is uh, usually quite mysterious and vital to a composition well as usual we have um this is the final isn't it or is this my break oh final oh well see i have to find out from from uh, because my, the, when the time goes so fast i sort of lose track whether or not we took a break already well here for the for 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 general purposes is the way you would go about interpreting a sky with clouds with an incidental tree uh and as the uh, oh and here's a wonderful uh, sort of a really thorny looking thingamabob here i don't know what kind of a tree it is but it's got all sorts of wonderful sort of spiny old shapes here in the in the um uh, silhouetted against the sky it could be it could be anything uh, I'm not sure without its leaves whether I could even guess what it is um, uh, but uh, let me see if I could guess it could be um it could be a sort of an old dogwood with the branches that are p pointing up because dogwoods tend to do that or it could be a dying dogwood because they are in trouble or it could be some sort of a great thorny thing that, that um, uh, the name of nobody knows anyway uh, that's it uh, time has run out. Sorry, I wish we had gone, we had been able to do it, but I'll finish this and show it to you some other time on another program. Uh, finish the tree and all that stuff. In uh, any way, I, I hope that you got something out of the business of painting a sky with clouds and a landscape at the bottom. Thanks again for watching, and uh, be sure to try and find these things in a row. Part one first, part two second. Bye-bye. Come again.